Hello and welcome to the introductory video on the instruments of the orchestra. Uh, it, this pertains to chapter 2 and part 1 of your textbook, uh, so you can go ahead and turn there. There is a section before that that deals with the vocal ranges, um, like soprano, alto, mezzo-soprano, stuff like that, but you can uh, look at that on your own. We're going to try to guide you through um, a section that people are less familiar with, and that's the instruments of the orchestra. So first of all, we're going to talk about the orchestra itself. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the guy standing up in front of the orchestra waving his arms and uh, what his role is. We're going to learn he's called the conductor. And then we're going to talk about the role of orchestras in the past versus their role in today's um, music world. So first of all, let's look at um, a picture of the orchestra here. And this is a, a medium-sized orchestra. There's no set number of instruments in an orchestra. Some are um, small. Some are these behemoth, you know, 100-plus uh, orchestras. It really depends on what kind of music um, they're going to be playing. Uh, earlier music, like from the 1600s and stuff, dealt with much smaller orchestras that, lock, that really didn't have a lot of brass and percussion in them. And, of course, as you approach the 20th century and into the 20th century, the orchestras got bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time you get to the late 1800s, um, like I said, they got to be, uh, some of them, these huge behemoth orchestras that are much larger than this one pictured. So first of all, we're going to divide the orchestra into four different families. You do have a chart in your textbook that shows you those four families. And the only problem I have with that chart is that it puts the piano in the string family. And I don't want you guys thinking that the piano is a string instrument because even if you look over the string section in your textbook, you don't find the piano anywhere. We're going to classify it as a keyboard instrument, and we're going to see those keyboard instruments uh, later. Along with the organ and harpsichord, the piano belong in that category. And the reason for that is that most keyboard instruments are designed to be played solo or with, you know, occasionally with other instruments. But as you can see in this picture, there's no piano. Um, most of the orchestral concerts I've been to, I've not seen a piano play. And we're going to learn that there's very specific musical forms that call for the piano. All right, so here are the four families we're going to look at. The, we have the strings here, which dominate the orchestra. We're going to learn that strings are called the heart of the orchestra for this reason. Without the strings, you don't really have an orchestra. You have more like a band or a wind ensemble. So we'll be looking at them first. Then you have the woodwinds. Then you had the brass, and then you had the percussion. And as we talk about each family, we're going to look at the major instruments in it, and we're going to talk about why they're classified as those types of instruments. Basically, we divide these instruments into their four families, uh, one of the four families, based on how they produce sound. It has absolutely nothing to do with... Um, what they're made out of like for instance if you see on a quiz uh, or an exercise if it asks you what makes a brass instrument a brass instrument do not say it's made out of brass because we're going to see that saxophones uh, are made out of brass and yet they're woodwind instruments so it's how they produce sound that's the main way we classify them the strings, you can see, dominate the orchestra, as we said. Uh, the woodwinds are a little small group. They're usually positioned uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, again, there's no set you know, number of instruments, and there's no set seating chart. This one actually splits the brass on both sides. Um, some have the brass all, you know, off to the right or off to the left. Uh, every orchestra is different, but the size and proportions, like you can see that we have a lot of strings, we have just a few woodwinds, just a few brass, and then the smallest section by number of performers, usually about two to five, is the percussion section. We usually put them in the back because you will see they will walk around and have to switch instruments often and it's not so much that their instruments are louder because some of them are actually kind of quiet um, but it's because they have to move around a lot as a matter of fact if you look at a uh, orchestral performer's shoes you can often tell if they're percussionists or not because sometimes percussionists are allowed to not wear dress shoes but instead wear like black Reeboks or something like that not always some of them have a stricter dress code than that um, so let's talk about this guy with the baton in his hand we do call that little stick that conductors have uh, a baton and they, yes they're called conductors um, sometimes you will hear them refer 
refer to as maestro. Maestro just means master in Italian, and it, it kind of denotes their role in the orchestra. They, they usually stand up here at the front, and you're probably familiar with seeing them move their arms around and things like that. So let's talk about what they do. Some people think they're just a human metronome, and they're just up there just telling the orchestra what beat, how fast, or how slow. But they do a lot more than that. First, they do a lot behind the scenes. A lot of it you don't see. They help select the music. They help run the orchestra. They help organize concerts. They help, um, you know, be a liaison between the orchestra and the audience. They'll often turn around and talk to the audience, some more than others. Um, the North Carolina Symphony that we've had, that we have here in North Carolina, has had very good conductors that I've seen that are very um, communicable with the audience. They'll they'll turn around and. and tell you a little bit about the piece and so our own North Carolina Symphony has usually been pretty good about that about educating the audience and helping draw them in and draw their interest into the music now they also in the actual concert they um, interpret the music and, and that is also the case in practice too um, during practice rehearsals you know think about how hard it is to get like four or five people to agree on pizza toppings well how do you get like 60 members of an orchestra to agree on how to how loud or soft or how fast or slow to play a piece of music because although composers did get pretty good with notating music and how it should be played there's always room for interpretation so unlike jazz where every um, member of the uh, of the group kind of gets to put in their own interpretation in an orchestra you follow the lead of the conductor um, for the most part so he's also able to communicate the emotion or mood that he's going for at a given period of time in the music uh, you can tell this often by his facial expressions his body language um, how broad or how tight he's um, you know conducting with his arms and by the way not all com conductors use that baton some of them just use their hands um, this conductor obviously is going for like joy and elation you know the music should be exciting and thrilling other times though they will they will communicate that the music should be held back and that the musicians should be very careful about how they're playing the music other times the com conductor can just kind of give a reassuring look and be like yeah that's how we did it in practice you know keep up the good work um, so conductors do a lot of things to assist the orchestra in the actual playing and help lead and guide them now orchestras are not a relic of the past it is true that orchestras are a very old institution that goes back um, you know over 400 years uh, but they are still alive and well as you can see here they play music for our movies and television shows part of that is that you're able to create so many rich and uh, you know different tone colors and atmospheres and stuff like that uh, you're able to evoke a lot of emotion by having so many instruments and uh, performers available to you uh, they also play a lot of the video game music um, ever since video games were able to incorporate live recorded sound now if you look at the early days of like arcade video games and early Nintendo games they had you know electrified well not really electrified I guess you would say electronic um, produced sound as part of its soundtrack so when you're listening to like Pac-Man or Super Mario Brothers or something like that it's obviously not an orchestra playing it but most modern day um, what we call AAA games which are you know you know uh, studio release titles and stuff like that the big studios that release the games they uh, they can afford orchestras because nowadays video games actually make more money than movies do so it's not just the big movie studios hiring these big orchestras to play their soundtracks it's also uh, video games so orchestras are still around they're still creating music matter of fact some of the best orchestral musicians in the world go go to where they record uh, video game and movie soundtracks um, because it's some of the highest paying work they can do and they can usually play this music wearing blue jeans instead of having to dress up and get in a tour bus and go all over the country playing uh, so orchestras still serve an important role however we do want to be able to get to the point where we can listen to an orchestra and not have a video game going on or a movie or something like that that's competing with our attention we want to be able to uh, sit down and listen to just an orchestra playing and kind of be more familiar 
about what the role of each instrument section is and to be able to distinguish say an oboe from a clarinet or a violin from a cello and things like that because the more familiar you are with the ensemble itself obviously the more familiar you're going to be with the the music and the more familiar it seems to us the easier it is for us to approach it the more alien it seems and the more we don't know about it it's we're going to have that natural aversion to it so education it will illuminate that area for us and we'll become familiar with it and we won't be so scared to listen to it.